How many people are there in this room? How many faces do you recognise? If I gave you all one hour, could you reach a stage where you knew everybody's name? How many Facebook friends do you have? How many real friends do you have? How many friends do you need to be happy? How many questions is one too many? Homo sapiens, we, us, exist in our current form because of two fundamental processes. Environmental selection and sexual selection. Well, that's the theory according to Darwin and his proponents. 200,000 years ago, we emerged on the savannah plain as anatomically modern human beings. We outwitted our opponent species in the unpredictable African environment. We came out on top. We were fitter for survival and reproduced more effectively. That's the basics established. We're here. Well done us. But what is it that we could do that they couldn't? What made us inherently better for survival? Specific cerebral circuits and cognitive patterns developed in our brains which allowed us to thrive as clan-living hunter-foragers. Living in a clan means living in close proximity with each other. It means active mutual protection, co-organisation and division of labour. Each individual in a clan understands how they relate to every other member and understands how every other member relates to all the other members in turn. So it's a complex network of social relations to keep in mind at any one time. And we existed in this way, as clans, for a large chunk of our evolutionary history, about 190,000 years. Then, 10,000 years ago, we invented agriculture. This allowed for wealth accumulation, it freed many from hand-to-mouth subsistence, and it allowed us to live in larger communities or civilizations. As I said, a key moment in our evolutionary history came at the time when our larger brains led us to live in clans or social groups, working cooperatively and collaboratively with each other. As collectives, we are more than the sum of our parts. And living cooperatively led to the development of language, of morality, and of systems for resolving internal and external conflict. But how big were these clans, these social groups? What was the optimum size, or the maximum size, and why is it relevant to us here today? British anthropologist Robin Dunbar has conducted extensive research into the mean social group size of various human communities over the last 200,000 years. Searching the anthropological and ethnographical literature for any census-like information on various hunter-gatherer communities, Dunbar found the most prevalent and commonly successful social group size to be 150. And this number occurs throughout our history. It's everywhere. It's the estimated size of a Neolithic farming village. It's the splitting point for Hutterite settlements in North America and Canada. It's the basic unit size of armies in Roman antiquity, 16th century Spain and 20th century Soviet Union. Even today, 150 is the typical size of a community of Bushmen in Southern Africa and of Native American tribes. The average number of Facebook friends any user has is 190, so fairly close. And the number of students in most state school year groups is 150. But why? Why 150? Are these just a series of coincidences? Dunbar found that the number of strong social relations a primate can track is limited by the volume of the neocortex in the brain. Now, in humans, the volume of the neocortex covers just about the whole brain. In other animals, it's proportionally much smaller. And what this suggests is that from the mean neocortical volume of any primate, scientists can calculate a sort of species-specific index of social group size. And this is how Dunbar arrived at his number. By extrapolating from the data on various other primate species. And it shows the larger the brain, the larger the social group size. And humans plotted onto this graph produces 
the number of 150 with an error margin. And there's evidence for this everywhere. 60% of world employment is in small companies of no more than 150 members. Every year, British households send Christmas cards to an average of 153.5 people. That's the total number of residents of the household sent to, not the number of cards. That would be a mad amount of cards. Um, and the company, the American company W.L. Gore and Associates, known best for the Gore-Tex brand, found by trial and error that 150 was the optimum number of optimum capacity for any of its company buildings. Any more than that, and social problems would be more likely to occur. So they started building buildings with 150 parking spaces. Once they would fill up, they'd build a new, near, new building nearby, transfer half the, the workforce, and the process would repeat, and so on. And so it seems that 150 is indeed a sort of cap on the clan size that we can handle. But why are we still cognitively limited to this number? We live today in communities of hundreds, thousands, even millions of people. Why do we still have the social capabilities of a Stone Age Homo sapien? The answer to this is very simple. Our minds simply have not had time to adapt to the drastic changes in societal structuration and size. I'll give you an idea of the relevant time frames. So the Homo genus evolutionary time frame runs from about 10 to 2 million years ago. That's an 8 million year evolutionary period. Homo sapiens evolved out of Homo erectus between 1.8 and 0.2 million years ago. So another 1.6 million years of evolutionary time. Clearly, it took us millions of years to reach 150. It stands to reason that it'll take millions more years to reach far beyond it. Hence. <laughs> but it is being shaken up. For most of our evolutionary history, we remained geographically close to those that we were born with. Clans were insular, families joined by marriage. You would live and die within your clan. Clearly, over the last 10,000 years, this has changed dramatically. Now, you might be born in one place, go to school in another, university in a third and work in a fourth, and form social circles in each of these localities. The modern human moves through several groups in a socially fragmented world, where each form part of a nuclear family, an extended family. We have friend groups pertaining to different locations or different interests. We have school friends, university friends, people we've met at festivals or whilst travelling. We form seminar communities, course communities, a campus community of 16,000 and a vague London community of 8.6 million. And we live in online virtual communities of hundreds or even thousands of people. But how have these fragments affected us? How do we keep track of so many social relations? And is it possible to feel a strong sense of community in such an expansive global arena compartmentalised in such a way. To think comprehensively about this, we need to turn to what I think is the most useful tool in our psychic inventory for coping with, cognising and comprehending the world around us. Language. Language is how, in the first place, we were able to function in social groups so much larger than our fellow primates. Whereas baboons bond by picking each other's nits, we have gossip, rhetoric, singing, storytelling and jokes to bring and hold us together. Dunbar says that language is how we used our big brains to reach 150. And until something as revolutionary or evolutionary as language comes along to replace it or sit on top of it, 150 is where he thinks we'll stay. With language, we make the social bonding process infinitely more efficient. We can transfer information, we can explain and describe how we feel, we can gossip, teach, learn, confide in each other and so on. Language reduces the time needed to build relationships. We can share anecdotes, combine histories, build at least superficially trusting relationships in relatively short periods of time. Without language, a social group or clan of 150 would have to spend so much time on social grooming that it would be unviable inefficient. The clan size would have to reduce, 
productivity would decline and we'd be back where we started. Therefore, language has allowed us to thrive in such large communities. However, it is also cheap social maintenance. The fact that language has rendered physical and social intimacy almost redundant means that we drift apart from each other physically. In London, you can get through a whole day without touching anyone or even without looking anyone in the, in the eye, if you so choose. Why? Because of language and the systems reliant upon language, we no longer need physical interaction for survival, at least not in a capitalist metropolis such as London. But we can and do combat this cheapness. Language also allows us to access conceptual levels of meaning that would otherwise be unavailable to us and communicate them between each other. With language, we can enact po politics, teach and learn more efficiently and effectively, give TED Talks, maintain at least moderate social cohesion on a huge scale, and most interestingly for me, create new forms of art. Language has given us poetry and politics, poetry and prose and lyrical music. It has contributed so much to comedy, film, theater, television, and so on. It is instrumental in our everyday lives and has become so integrated into our decision-making process that we would struggle to, co to conceive of a world without it. But, if I ask you to think back to the time in your life when you were happiest, the single most joyfully memorable moment in your entire life, what were you doing? According to a survey conducted by the Huffington Post of January this year, these are some of the most commonly recalled happiest moments among people over 70. Dropping in on a half pipe for the first time, getting your first loaf of bread out of the oven, swimming with turtles, making love, these are languageless moments. Often it is in doing things which require no linguistic comprehension that we feel happiest. Those moments which we can't put into words often don't involve words themselves. So, where does this leave us? We owe a lot to language, that much is clear. It has allowed us to live in larger communities, to build huge societal concepts, to teach more efficiently, bond more effectively, to enact politics to communicate codes of ethics and philosophies between each other and invent new forms of art. But it is also important to consider where and when language is useful. Do we overuse it? Has it reached its evolutionary potential? What will come next, if anything? Will we ever live in a world without language? I don't know but maybe we can use it well to find out. Thank you.